now on the campuses, that um, really expands the people that can take one certain class. So I think it's a good idea, I like it. But with all these variants running around, who knows what's gonna happen. All right, guys, before we get to uh, the film for today, we have to cover this bit of class business. And that is the third, or the second short paper. Okay, the second short paper. So for Nicole, who Nicole just heard, I guess gave her the same exact assignment in her last class. So she says, forgive me, Nicole. Um, but this paper is a sequel, prequel, or remake evaluation of one of these films that we've done this semester. Okay. And I've given you a list. I came up with a list of different ones that you can do on the second page of this prompt. There's not actually not a whole lot of them. For Blade Runner, we have the sequel, Blade Runner 2049. Chinatown, you got the sequel called The Two Jakes that you can do. Um, I know, didn't you say you were gonna watch that crystal? Or you have seen it? I haven't ever seen it actually. The 1973 remake of Double Indemnity. That was a remake in 1973. The Big Sleep had a remake in 1978. 2010, 2001 A Space Odyssey has a sequel called 2010, The Year We Made Contact. I've never seen that one either. So. Uh, I can't verify if it's good or not. Silence of the Lambs, there's lots of things you could do if you're interested in that text. You could do Hannibal, which was 2001, a direct sequel of Silence. Uh, that film was directed by Ridley Scott, who did Blade Runner, if, you're, uh, if you remember. Red Dragon, the 2002 film, was a prequel of Silence of the Lambs. Manhunter is a movie from 1987. That's the same story as Red Dragon, only it was actually made before Silence of the Lambs. Um, that's actually a better film than Red Dragon, in my opinion. Like, I think so. It's very 80s. You have a film called Hannibal Rising from 2007, which was supposed to be Hannibal's origin story. Um, You've, uh, Thomas Harris actually had to write a book for that just to be able to keep the rights for the franchise. So that's the only reason why that that's the only reason why that book and movie even came into existence. It's because the uh, studio was going to take away his his money if he didn't do something with it. Mm. It's a fun fun fact there. It's not a bad movie. I enjoyed it. And then. Um, there's a hand, there was a Hannibal TV show that went three seasons from 2013 to 15. Great show. You know, we talked about Mads, or we talked about uh, Hopkins's performance as Lecter, but uh, Mads Mickelson's performance as Lecter is very riveting performance too in that show. Um, you can speak to that, Crystal. You've seen the show, haven't you? Yeah, he's, he's awesome in that role. Oh man, it is so great. It's like you can't stop watching it. You have to binge watch because you just can't stop. You just it's awesome. It really is. It it brings to light it's more focused on everyone else as well as him. It's not just him, but it does I think focus on his taste and his stature and how he he is too. Yeah, that shows on Netflix, I know. And then there's a there's a new show that's on the air right now called Clarice on CBS that um, you could perhaps do. And that's a show about Clarice that's not allowed to have Hannibal in it, mm. right? That's, the rights are tied up in a couple of different places. Like certain people have rights to the character of Hannibal and in the Red Dragon story and even the sequel, but. Another person has the rights just to Clarice Starling, but without any of the other characters. So it's a big mess. 
But there is actually a show just about Clarice Starling in the FBI right now. That's a kind of like a CSI type show. The Exorcist, you have The Exorcist 2, The Heretic, Exorcist 3 from 1990. There's a movie from 2004 called Exorcist The Beginning. Then there's a movie called Dominion Prequel to The Exorcist. The Exorcist at the Beginning and Dominion Prequel to The Exorcist are kind of the same thing, but not really. One is an extreme direct, Dominion is an extreme director's cut. Exorcist's beginning had a lot of studio interference. It wasn't too good. So they later came out with Dominion prequel to The Exorcist, which was the director's true vision for it. So uh, he wanted to do one of those. And then there was an Exorcist TV show that came out a couple of years ago that had two seasons. And that's available on Hulu. Okay, so very good show. It's a pre, it's a, you could probably just do one, the first season of that if you were interested. I think it's like eight or nine episodes. But it was almost like a sequel to the original movie, ignoring all the other sequels. <clears throat> and then The Thing as their last choice. You have the 1951 film called The Thing from Another World. Carpenter's film is technically a remake of that film. Okay. So if you were going to do that, you would you would almost have to kind of flip the way you do the paper, right? How does Carpenter's stack up with the original, right? Since Carpenter's mm -hmm. is technically the remake. Would The Conjuring 2 count? Or is that not like technically a prequel or a remake? Uh, what do you mean? Like, uh, could we do it on the Conjuring Two? I think that's what it's called. It's like the um, one at the one that they released after the Conjuring. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do that, I, I would be fine with it. I'm familiar with all those films. I think two is better than one, personally. I don't know if you agree with me or not. I do. And then The Thing had a prequel from 2011, which I talked about before in class. Those are your options. If you want to do something else, you can ask, like Nicole just did. I might say yes or no. Depends if I've seen it or not. Okay. So what you're doing in this paper then, <clears throat> you're taking one of these films we've watched. You, of course, want to watch one of these other ones. So pick which film you like the most. That's probably my best advice. Like pick which film you like most. Like I'm sure, like I'm sure Bill will probably do one of the Lecter ones, right? Just because he's, that was his yeah. text. I will. <laughs> yeah. Pick which, pick whichever one you're interested in most and then run or run with it. So the way that you're going to do this paper, so in your, in your sort of introduction and thesis, what you what you do is you pretty much develop a set of criteria. Okay, so you develop a set of criteria, so maybe three or four criteria. So from the original film. So what in the original film works, right? Or what didn't work even in the original film? Like you usually do that by thinking about themes. So like the way that we the way that we talk about these films in class, we talk about all these themes. Let's take Silence of the Lambs as an example, right? We talked about all kinds of themes in that, like transphobia, um, a man, a woman being in a man's world, um, the elect, the elector character, and is <laughs> is a theme in and of itself, right? Buffalo Bill's character is a theme in and of itself. So, like, you think about what worked in the, in the original or what didn't, as I said, then you apply that to the sequel, prequel, or remake. Right? So, how does the sequel, prequel, or remake treat these same themes? Right? Does it perhaps add value to the original text? Does it create a whole new text, right? a really good original text? 
or is it worse than the original in a, in a big way? Or is it somewhat on par with the original? Basically what, basically what I'm asking you to do is watch one of these films. Does it, in your opinion, does it work in relation to the original or does it not? Right. And what are some three or four reasons why in relationship with the original? So what I would like you to do with those criteria in relation to the original is probably themes, right? But you could also talk about filmmaking. Right? So not just not just um, thematic concerns, but also filmmaking. So maybe you would want to talk about how the camera works and uh, I don't know if Manhunter compared to Silent to the Lambs, right? You know, so that that could be a criteria you could establish. Like what how do some film techniques work too? So you can talk about either or film techniques or content or thematic content or both if you want. So this is all purely your opinion. Right? There, there's nothing objective about this. This is purely your opinion. So when you watch this new film, what does it do you like it? Do you think it worked? Is it does it add something really good and new? Or is it repeating the same crap? Is it worse? Right? So whatever and that, that oftentimes too depends too on the see whether it's a sequel or a remake or a prequel, right? So like even the Hannibal Rising, right? We talked about how uh, Hannibal Lecter is such a strange character because he's so mysterious in a way. Well, you can think about that movie, right? Does it, knowing his backstory, does that diminish the character in your eyes, right? That would be a good paper idea, probably. Well, well Again, just pick whichever one you want to do, you like the most, and run with it. If you think it worked in comparison with the original, why or why not? Think of three or four reasons. Okay. And then you, then in the paper, once you get to the paper itself and the body, what you will be doing then is taking those three or four criteria you've established. And then in the paper itself, you're evaluating those criteria. So like, for instance, if you talk about Silence of the Lambs, right, with uh, Hannibal Rising, right, one of your criteria would be the Lecter character, right? Well, how does that, getting that backstory, what does that do? Or um, say you wanted to do The Exorcist Three, right? Well, maybe one of your criteria is good scares, right? good supernatural horror right well how would you define good supernatural horror and what how does the exorcist 3 stack up with the original right so you make you're pretty much making up your own criteria here for what worked or what didn't in the original text okay so go back to our discussions you guys know all our discussions are posted on our blackboard page go back to our discussions if you want to refresh yourself. Um, I've listed all the of options that you have here based on the films we've done in this class. The way it, some of the only when we got the horror did we really get a lot of franchises. Um, a lot of these movies that we've watched in here have been pretty standalone. Sci-fi and horror have had a lot, have a lot. The drama and westerns unit we did and noir. Well, drama and westerns, there's no, nothing from those. Uh, noir had a couple of remakes. So, um, when, whenever you do talk in the body of the paper, whenever you're evaluating your criteria, do incorporate specific evidence from the films. So maybe you would just talk about like certain scenes, kind of like how you did in the first short paper, right? Talk about certain scenes as your evidence here. You know, you, there will be some element of summary involved here because, of what, because maybe in like a paragraph after your intro or something, you'd want, you would want to talk about 
maybe sum up the film, the new, the prequel, remake, sequel, like briefly discuss its plot. Don't go a whole page about it or something, but just give us the basic details about what the sequel, prequel, remake is, what its story is and all that. What major differences you notice. This is going to be due the Friday the 23rd, next Friday, 11.59 p.m. on Blackboard. You guys know how I am. I'll probably give next Thursday when we get here, I'll probably be like, hey, you can turn it in Monday instead. You know how I am, right? But for now, for now, it's due the 23rd. You guys know I always like to push stuff back because that's who I am. It's who I am inside, right? So uh, right now, plan for that date, just to get you going. Um, so um, again, you'll use the same formatting as last time. That's for the midterm and for the first short papers, MLA. And then my hope for this is, because the very last project we're gonna do in this class is an extended version of one of your papers that you've already done. Okay, so maybe this will be a good avenue for doing that later. Right? So maybe if you, maybe you would want to do a evaluation of a couple of different versions of one of these texts, right? Well, that could be a project you could do later. Right? So I'm thinking that this short paper might give birth to uh, an idea for your extended paper later in the class, because you are going to be taking one of the three papers you've done up up to that point and then building on it further. That's what you're gonna be doing in your final paper. Okay, so I'm thinking this will be a good resource for you by just doing this. So uh, quest questions, comments, concerns, anything I can answer about, uh, about this. I'll get this up on Blackboard for you so you'll have it. I just wrote the prompt just a few minutes ago. So um, anything I can address about what you do? Does it make sense? Questions you got? Let, let me have them. Okay, I just wanna make sure that I'm right. So you're gonna do your intro and then you want just a brief summary of, of the, the new film. Right. Okay, well, that's how I'm just gonna clarify it's new film, of the new film and uh, maybe some of the differences or, or the similarities um, that's in the one that we had that we watched. And then you're going to go into the body of your paper and you're going to post your opinion in specific scenes or whatever to back up what your original thought was and then obviously close it out. Am I right? Right. When you get to the body of the paper, that's when you invent that's when you should arrange it according to your criteria, right? So the criteria is what you make up about what you think works with the original, right? So was it the camp, was it the filmmaking that worked in the original? Was it um, the themes that worked in the original, right? So you'll organize each paragraph of that according to one of those criteria you come up with. So like what worked about the original, right? What did you, what would, a good way to think about that is what did we discuss in class about the original, right? That's, that's probably a good way to come up with your criteria. Right? What, what did we discuss in class? Um, and then how does that criteria apply to the sequel, prequel, remake? Okay. Does that make, does that make sense, Crystal? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good. Is that three to four pages or what was it? I forgot. Yes, I wrote, I have here three to five, somewhere in there. Oh. If, yeah, if you're in that ballpark, you're good. Three, three is probably the baseline minimum, I would say, just to do this justice. Yeah, I see I it do, now. I'm sorry. I do have some examples that I can give you from previous classes. Um, who've done something like this. It might be on a film you haven't seen, 
Um, I did something like this when I taught a class just on horror movies once. Um, so I do have some examples I can dig up. I need to go through them and read through them again. It's, it's been several years since I've taught an assignment like this. So uh, I'll go dig through my paper graveyard and see if I can come up with some good examples. Okay, I do. I do remember someone wrote a really good paper for me once about the Rob Zombie Halloween remake in comparison with the original. She really liked, this person really liked the remake. I completely hate the remake. I think it's a terrible movie. But she made such a good argument that it, that it, uh, it was an A paper, right? So, uh, yeah, so... I'll probably that will probably be an example. I'll show you because I remember that was a really good. Like she still didn't change my mind, but she she presented a good argument, right? So, so um, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I might find something here. I don't. I don't remember what all was done for me. I'll I will especially dig to see if someone wrote something good for one of the films we have watched, just to see you can see how this works. Okay, so we'll have examples for you. Other questions, comments, concerns before we talk about the Babadook? Uh, just a comment I have about uh, what you said about her paper. Um, her paper, it, it showed a good argument, but you know, a lot of times I've watched a lot of these movies that we have looked at going in. I didn't like that genre or probably didn't like whatever. Uh, but through the inner the discussion and hearing and reading and the um, the threads that we put on, I have changed. I have changed my mind. All the movies. Every one of them that I've looked at that didn't partic that I didn't particularly care about, after our discussion, I liked it much better. Uh, I, I think that, you know, sometimes in my life I've just been a movie watcher, and so the opinions of uh, of all the class members and the instructor have made this a more enjoyable uh, uh, field of entertainment for me. Um, it's yeah. a lot more interesting than it used to be. I could speak for experience too. First time I watched the movie Interstellar, I hated it. I hated that movie. Like Corey, Corey made me appreciate it more that day. Yeah, that, that's uh, true. Yeah, so uh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I put it on the syllabus just because I want. I wanted to see if I would change my mind. And you guys did. You changed my mind about that movie, especially. So. Yeah. Well, I could be of service. Yeah. Good, good job, Corey. Yeah. So, all right. So let's talk then about the movie The Babadook. It's a 2014 film. This is a, this might be our first, well, besides Once Upon a Time on the West, this might be our first example of a non Hollywood film. This movie is an Australian film. Made in 2014, directed by, this is actually directed by a female director. Um, have, I can't think of anything else we've watched so far that has a female director. I might be wrong. We have a female director here. Jennifer Kent is her name. To date, she hasn't done much. She's done this film. and She's done another film from 2018 called, um, she's mostly done TV not film. She did another film called The Nightingale from 2018. That's it, really. Uh, she's a very much a newcomer. And this movie was, this movie became a hit thanks to Netflix. Netflix had this, does it's not on there now for some reason. So for two or three years, Netflix had this movie. This movie kind of became a hit on Netflix. You know, that's how I first saw the film. It reached the whole global audience through that through the power of that medium. Um, so, um, and I do know that um, this 
the car- the figure of the Babad- they Netflix accidentally put classified this as an LGBT movie, even though it's really not. So, uh, so I knew I do know that this movie has been appropriated by that culture by that subculture. And the Babadook creature has become an icon of, even though it has nothing to do with, even though the movie has nothing to do with that. Because Netflix miscategorized it, it became a became a um, mm. icon for that community. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, I read about that, and it was kind of bizarre how they was trying to justify it and explain it that the Babadook was kind of like yeah you know, a stature for them and mm. of this rebellion and I, I don't know, I didn't get it. <laughs> I, th- I think they just adapted it for that culture just because, right? It's almost like an inside joke. I think I think that's uh, how they did it. Um, but yeah, this this is I've always found this movie. I found this movie very fascinating. This is some really good psychological horror um, about this mom and this boy Samuel. Right? <laughs> so. I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to turn the floor over to you guys. What was your thoughts on this film, The Babadook? Well, I guess I'll stick with a little bit of tradition here. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first watched it, you know, Dad and I usually watch our films together, and um, I watched it by myself. <laughs> and um, I was like, wow. You know, it's like, this is so dark and dreary and heavy. And at first I was like, this kid, I swear I would pull him up by the arm and beat him half to death and make him listen. But (laughs) once you stop and think about the film and you think about its meaning um, and then you start to sit and really critically think it out. I mean, that there's just a part of depression and grief that can actually consume you. And your mind is so magnificent, we can say that in both a negative and positive manner, that it's so magnificent that it could um, make you see, feel, and hear things that are not there, but there's no doubt in, in your mind that that's, that's what's there. <clears throat> and um, I, was, I was impressed with the film after I watched it. It was one of those that had to soak in for me, and I've kind of talked about that before. It kind of had to soak in for me, but I think that it had a good meaning. Even though it's, like, classified as a horror film, I think that, you know, kind of showing you that, hey, you need to face your demons before you go and and let them consume you, I think is a good message. And I felt sorry for that kid at the end. He didn't really get a whole lot of nurture and affection from his mother, um, there was no happiness. Even the cartoons and the stories was about the big bad wolf or, you know, whatever. It was never anything positive and upbeat in his life. There was never a smile, like, you know, you'll just pass somebody in the hallway or whatever and smile or watch a kid play and smile. There was never laughter. I mean, it was just always so dreary. And I believe that her insomnia um, had a lot to do with her mind and what was going on with her, but I feel like that his fear of monsters and stuff was just a reflection of what that he was feeling from his mother, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's how that's how I seen it, but I definitely appreciated it more once I started really critically thinking about it. Other thoughts? I don't know about anybody else, but out of all of the horror movies we watched, this was the most genuinely scary to me. Like, this had the most creepy scenes. I was legit, like, curled up in a ball, had my had my chair up against the wall watching it, had a blanket over me so the Babadook wouldn't get me. Like, most of the time, like I have this curtain here and to just ramble. I'm gonna show y'all how dark it is. That's how dark it is. Uh, even in the middle of the day, it's just pitch black. 
I absolutely could not do that. I had the lights on the entire movie. <laughs> I agree with you there, Corey. I thought it was a really well done horror movie. You know, like it wasn't just jump scares. There was a lot of build up to the horror, and it really just drew the viewer. In. And some of my thoughts on um, the mother's attitude and kind of her grief and the way that it manifested, I really understood that, and I felt very sympathetic because, you know, when you think about. A family when you think about you know a husband and wife are making this conscious decision and agreement to have a family and to raise a child and to do it together but he I suppose from her point of view he got out of it I guess you could say which you know that isn't really how it happened he passed away but you know a big part of grief is anger and thinking about myself you know if I was pregnant and if my fiance died like right before I had the baby I would be furious you know I'd be furious at him I'd be furious at the universe and I can understand how that anger was projected onto her son although I don't think it was right I can't understand it and I think that the grief is a huge part of all that yeah I think Nicole hit on something that I think is very important to go along with the whole beginning of the movie that continuous and that is that is the relationship um you know first of all she lost her husband and i think that if we i think that i heard it had been seven years since he died six or seven years uh the boy lost his dad so there is there's there's no touching uh there's no companionship uh you know we are humans, we're made up um, to touching is very important to us. Whether people think we evolved from something or that we were created by God or whatever, however that comes about, uh, we are people that need to be touched. We need to have, um, you know, a relationships. And, and I believe that this woman lost her, her, her partner, her relationship pal. She was a deprived woman of needs and she was a young woman. And yet she clung to her dead husband for all those years. No wonder the boy had problems. Um, it, there was a, dysfunction about this family that was brought about by the tragedy of death and it could happen to any one of us i found myself uh giving the babadook uh, a place in identifying emotions and the lack of normalcy so i think that there was no happiness the crystal hit on this also there's no happiness in this family there was it was lack of and far as what Corey said i man crystal picked the wrong time not to watch a movie with her old dad because i mean <laughs> i was like Corey. i i kept thinking and we gave a place where we watched movies that it's it's a, like a little movie house here and um i don't i don't no more scary movies by myself i mean that's just you know it's not my genre anyway but I found it absolutely fascinating. I have a lot of, a lot of, I thought it was a lot of mind stuff and I know we'll touch base, but I think relationship or lack of relationship had a lot to do with this movie. Well, I can um, relate to her. I mean, I've been really extremely grief stricken before. I mean, there was an instance that happened in my life and, you know, if it hadn't been for my parents, um, I don't believe, I believe I could have very well been exactly how she was. So I can relate with that. I can relate with being angry. I can relate with not wanting to smile. And I can, I can't imagine her situation, um, you know, that she was, her husband's taking her to the hospital so she can have this child. And there's a car wreck, he dies. She goes on to have this baby she may project, and I believe she does, project a lot of that anger 
towards that boy, even though he don't know what's going on. I mean, he didn't ever meet his dad. And now he's at the age that he's in school. So he's seeing that, hey, there is a difference. All these people have daddies and I don't have one. Like, why? What is he? And he feels like he has to protect his mom, like he's the man of the house. Um, and it, it's really sad. I mean, even her sister won't uh, extend enough support to her. And I mean, that's that's what it takes, I think. I think whenever you get that far, there's no pulling out yourself. You need a support system. And I think that's what she needed and she didn't have it. She didn't get it from the school system. She didn't get it from, um, I guess, child services. She didn't get it from anyone and not even at her job. I mean, she had the one guy that kind of joked around with her just in passing, but she just didn't, even the patients that she dealt with, she didn't have any kind of positive anything in her life. Everything was doom and gloom, which would make you concentrate more on that. I agree with you, Crystal. And, you know, this whole movie made me think about the saying that we all know it takes a village to raise a child. And this film really showed what happens when that village doesn't come through and when there is no village. And uh, to touch on one of the discussion questions that Dr. Yeager posted is what we actually think the monster was. I don't know what you guys think, but I felt like the creature was really an embodiment of grief is what I felt that it was. I felt that it was the resentment that she had towards that child for, I don't know, maybe blaming the child for the situation that caused her husband to die. Cause you know, you think about it, the reason they were in that car is because she was going to deliver him. And even though, like Crystal said, it was not his fault whatsoever. I do see how someone who is caught in grief could blame that, or could look for someone and need someone to blame that on and who can't really accept that bad things just happen for no reason and I think that that creature really and this film did really well of embodying grief in the creature right to, to build off what Nicole said right that the the very ending the, sometimes people get confused about the ending of this movie um, if we are applying what Nicole said to the ending right you know the way that she the Babadook still in the basement at the at the end, right? She's she has to go and feed it worms. I, uh, if we look at the Babadook as a metaphor for grief, maybe right? She's it's grief. It's something that you never lose, right? It's something that it's something that never fades away. I mean, it's something you always kind of have to live with, right? Even even if it's locked up in the basement, right, of your own mind, right? So. That's I agree. I agree with you, Nicole. I think that's what it that, that's what it is at its heart. Like I think the the creature is a symbol in a way, but we can also view it as quite a literal monster too, if we want. Right? Somebody sent her that book, right? With uh, with the mom picture of a mom killing the kid, right? Somebody sent that. Somebody sent that to her. Um, other thoughts well we'd have to think about if if nicole is correct and she's really really probably spot on here um this grief brought about other things uh if this grief was the foundation of this household then it brought upon fear and frustration and this fear and frustration it 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 learned to go out of control for years and years it was never harnessed it was never brought to a happy meeting i was thinking about you know we see samuel as a seven-year-old what about when he was seven days old seven weeks was he held and caressed or was his little belly and face dabbled by tears from this woman here is a lot to consider here and so this grief could have taken this family beyond, you know, repair, apparently so. Um, so I, I believe she's, you know, I, I really believe she's got something there. And to tag on to what Crystal had said, grief can absolutely destroy a person. And so thank God for family, people, friends, 
uh, a relationship with with the Lord, whatever that can get us through those things to put a harness on something that could be terrible. I think we see the terrible part of grief here in this movie. Yeah, the creature is quite literally harnessed at the end, Bill, in the, in the basements. And harness is a good word there for, for it. And, and the basements where all of um, his possessions were. So that's where the boy goes, I think, to feel closeness to his father, but yet she won't go down there. She'll even want to hear his name. But dad had mentioned something in, in his thread about the neighbor, uh, Mrs. Roach. And, you know, maybe it was her that, that put the book there. Maybe she's trying to, where she, I believe that she lived with it too. Whenever he mentioned, you know, he, she was washing those dishes and looked through the window and the Babadook is in the old lady's apartment. You know, she's dealt with her own kind of grief. Obviously she was alone. All she seemed to have was them. And maybe she put that down there as a warning, not so much as a, you know, an opening into this whole mind game, but maybe as a warning, like if you don't get yourself together, this could happen. I mean, I guess you could look at it and take down every rabbit hole imaginable, but um, I mean, it could have been her. So it seems like when things were at its very height as its climax, the old lady's the one that knocked on the door. Now granted, he did call her, but it was a while later and then she knocked on the door to say, um, you know, I just want you to know that I care about you guys. And then that's whenever the mom seemed to, it seemed that she was snapping out of it, so to speak. But, and also um, we had, I'm sorry, Crystal. I was gonna say also we had to remember what her last name was. Her last name was Mrs. Roach. And we see these roaches coming out most, uh, you know, weird times. So just a thought. And, you know, to add to what Crystal was saying, I definitely think that is a, a really viable option for what Miss, if, for if Miss Roach did give that book. But I thought of it as almost a prompting to face the grief. Like I thought of the book as literally being, you know, a wake up call, you know, you can't stop hiding it. You can't stop ignoring it. Because I feel like before the Babadook was physically there, the grief was there and the pain was there. And when they were forced to face that physical aspect of it, they had to face the theoretical grief as well. I was about to say that same thing. I was going to say that uh, uh, that why do I blank? I just blanked. Whatever. There's so much in there, and it, they, it's all trying to get out at once. Exactly. Exactly. It had something to do with the fact that she's grieving. Uh, oh, well. I'll think about it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Kirsten just read us a comment that talks about how she used the movie from how it's like the stages of grief, right? That movie is almost a, you guys who take psychology class, refresh us on those. I know denial, acceptance, like what are the stages again? You guys know? I think acceptance is the very last one. Right. I yeah. know that the Sorry, go ahead, Crystal. No, I was just saying anger, baby. Go ahead. Yeah, anger. I think I'm not sure about the order, but I know it's like anger, denial. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the word for this, but like blame is one of them. Blaming is a big one. And I know I know there are five. I don't know the other two, though, or the other one. And, you know, I feel like I feel like a big part of the reason, just to build on some of the things that we've all discussed, I feel like one of the big part of the reasons that the mother really took out so much anger and so much grief on her son is because he didn't have any grief. You know, if she wouldn't have enacted that on him, he would have been a really happy child. He would have never really known that he was missing anything. 
And I feel like the fact that she didn't have anyone to share that with was a big, big motivator to what happened. Yeah, even when he says that, when he, even when he explains how his dad died, you don't hear any sadness in it. He's always like almost saying it in a happy way. Not necessarily in a happy way, but like in the innocent way that kids do. And it's like, she's almost like, why are you not giving this the respect it deserves? And he's obviously a little kid. He doesn't necessarily have that yet. He doesn't have that empathy. Uh, what I remember, what I was going to say now, is that uh, you could almost think that uh, the Babadook showing up at her uh, doorstep, if you want to think about it in a more abstract way, in a less of a somebody physically gave her the book, it would almost be like her playing out the scenario in her head to force herself to finally face this grief face this trauma she's she's been dealing with because it almost feels like it's been showing us for the past six years since it's happened she's just been going through the motions and she's just she's put it in the back of her head she hasn't dealt with it it's still present in her mind but she's not necessarily uh doing anything to progress she's just kind of in the state of purgatory for lack of a better word and then having the Babadook finally uh, gets the wheels going in terms of uh, letting this very intimidating very scary almost like a monster uh, challenge in front of her and finally overcoming it Now, what did you guys think of um, this performance from, from this kid, Samuel? Um, he, definitely, he definitely succeeds in grading on your nerves at the beginning. Am I right? Bill said he wanted to take him out back early, earlier, right? I think for a child his age, he done a phenomenal job in uh, playing this paranoid um he played scared great uh he played weirdo great i mean he was um he played brat amazing <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean he he did i mean he just he he done a, a very good job especially at his age yeah you could definitely feel the mother's frustration with us how he was behaving yeah he had a um he had a matter of fact type of way to express himself he which shows me there wasn't a lot of empathy in his younger uh in in his younger days his his time of being a baby or a toddler there wasn't a lot of empathy for him even in his own household uh so i think we see him Matter of fact, he played several different characters in this movie, I believe. I, I believe he was multi-talented. I don't know who this young boy was or if he's playing in anything now, which we lose a lot of child actors through the process of them growing up. But here, he shows everything except happiness. Um, grief, anger, depression, uh, being a bratty kid. So, and, and, and it's justified being, he was justified, I think, in being the bratty kid. I don't believe it was his, you don't have to teach a child to do wrong. They were naturally do wrong. You have to teach them to do right. I believe she was preoccupied with her grief that it was very hard for her to teach him anything positive. I like the scene with the cousin near the beginning, like when, He's with his cousin and she's being like super mean to him. And then he pushes her out of the tree house. Right. I'm like, that's wrong, but I'm kind of on his side here. Right. Me too on that. Yeah, she got what she deserved. <laughs> <laughs> but the time that he was in the backseat of the car and he was like losing his mind. 
uh, my parents would have pulled the car over or just smacked me like this, <laughs> pulled the car over and picked a switch and I'd have got it. <laughs> I wouldn't have acted like that. <laughs> but it's but, that is right on he was not taught. He wasn't, um, kids don't know how to react. So they act out. And whenever they act out, that's just because they don't know how to deal with whatever they're going through. And he didn't know how to deal with it. That's why he was in trouble at school. School didn't have no empathy at all on him, much less sympathy to be able to talk to him. That would have been an outlet for him, but instead it wasn't. It wasn't someone else pushing him away. He was never accepted ever with anyone. He was always pushed away. Mrs. Roach probably accepted him more than anybody did in the whole yeah. movie. I, I thought the camera did a tremendous job on showing the reaction to people like of the community uh, at the party. These people didn't have to say anything. The camera did the talking for them. Those expressions of disgust about even her, maybe not being uh, socially or economically on the realm that they were. You could see it in the camera, how they did this. And you knew when they were up there in that little tree house, water, you knew that Samuel was going to push her out. The camera lets you know that long before it happened. Speaking of which, I love how it builds up the suspense with those early scenes with Samuel. Because it'll show it'll show him obviously about to do something very dangerous. And then it'll show the mom talking about something. And it just kind of gets the the conversation between the mom. And whoever she's talking to gets a little bit more intense. And then you look over and you see him like grabbing a rod or something like that. And it's like, you know, something's going to happen. Like you can tell it's like that ticking time bomb. Like, you know, by just by showing Samuel and showing her, you know, something is bound to happen. Like whenever the the ladies were all together and the one lady said something to her and she felt like that that was a a sarcastic remark about oh I bet it would be hard without a husband kind of deal and then she goes on to, to talk about um I've not been able to make it to the gym <laughs> and and her anger and bitterness comes out then because she's thinking you know you can't make it to the gym well I can't even have five minutes peace because I'm the only one raising this child. And, you know, he's <laughs> the spawn of Satan. <laughs> but, you know, he's um, just, she has no time for her. So she lashes out at her as well. And, and you can just tell, I mean, you see those women and they were dressed pretty and their, their height, their hair was even lighter. You know, you can see that, that kind of film technique as far as that goes. Everything about her was just drab. Even if she had on pink, it was a, a very um, downplayed, like mauve kind of dusty pink. It, nothing was bright. Nothing in that house was bright. When her sister talked about she, it was depressing for her to go over there because you could feel the depression, you know, in the house and the doom and the gloom. And that's true. And everything she watched on TV, like down to everything that they done. There was nothing that was colorful or happy or joyous at all in their lives. It, it was total misery. But he was very um, <laughs> entrepreneurial, I get, entrepreneurial, I can't say it. I guess because look, look at that little contraption he made <laughs> that he wanted to put on his back all the time and about took her out with that stuff. <laughs> it looked like a croquet ball, ball that he <laughs> flung at her. <laughs> like catapulted to her and stabbed her in the leg and you know, he got her back. <laughs> yeah, and a couple of other scenes uh, build on what Bill said. I really like the one with, um, when she goes to the police station, she's trying to tell him this crazy story. And like, you could just kind of tell like, they're not taking her seriously and stuff through the, through the camera. They don't even have to say anything, really. You just tell that. I, th I thought that was an interesting scene. Yeah. 
You also get the perspective of the Babadook ones when, in a first person view, when it goes to the basement after it retreats and whatever. So you get, you get, that's an interesting perspective too, through the perspective of the evil entity as it goes to the, to the basement. Um, that's a, if you guys have ever seen the movie, The Evil Dead, it, it, that kind of borrows inspiration from that. Oftentimes in The Evil Dead, you'll get that fast paced first person camera like knocking trees down in the woods and all this stuff so that that was a very much a homage to that too but she she kind of throws up a standard against him there when she's crying out you're not you know you're not going to take over my home whatever i don't remember what she said but she finally takes a stand against the uh, babadook um and that's when he retreats kind of and then, but she still clings on to that and holds on to it as evidenced by them going out and getting worms for him. Yeah, I liked um, the stuff she watched on TV too, built on what Crystal mentioned a minute ago. I think I had a discussion question about that. Like she's watching these old black and white, almost like creepy German expressionism type films from like the twenties on there. I'm like, I was thinking to myself, what TV channel shows German expressionism movies? Or anything? But, but she, she's she's watching those. Misery Love Company. <laughs> she's like that old 1920s Nosferatu film. It's all, that's what it reminded me of that she. She was watching. I thought it was interesting how she started seeing herself in the news. Like she almost got like a future prophecy in the news mm. after after she murders her kid. That I genuinely thought, scared the crap out of me. Scared the crap out of me. I cussed. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> because I I wasn't expecting it. Because I seen a, I seen a lady's face, and right as soon as I seen the lady's face, it didn't even give me enough time to react, and it just zoomed up on her face, and it ah, scared me. Yeah, we we haven't talked about her performance as much as much as her character, but the actress's performance here was good too. She really she almost did a Jack Nicholson in The Shining type of role. Right? Just, character who slowly becomes unhinged the further we go um, she's very creepy once uh, once she uh, snaps like she she does she commits the cardinal sin in a movie by the way of, of killing the dog right? that's that's the cardinal sin in, in movies you, you can't kill a dog right you're irredeemable after you kill the dog yep. She played exhausted extremely well. She looked the part, she acted the part, and she would still, she knew that there was no one else to depend to depend on, like to pay the bills or whatever. So she continued to get up. And then that one day, whenever she called in to work because she was just so exhausted, and then they obviously had something to say. And you didn't see her go back to work after that, but she played exhausted extremely well. You really like uh, empathize with her, not only through Samuel, but like you could just see how emotionally exhausted she was. Like you could just tell. You know, I, the social workers, they were a trip, I thought. I mean, really. I mean, they had no very little compassion and, and, uh, I don't know. I don't think they did a lot to help the family out any. Right. It's, it, the movie seemed to be a critique of social workers in a way, right? Yeah. On, yeah. on how they they have to check their boxes on their forms and you lose a little bit of families and their complex relationships that way.
Maybe they were right, though. Maybe they were right, considering she did she did snap on her kid. Yeah. Yeah, Corey mentioned earlier, like, how it just scared him a couple of times. Um, really great lighting in the movie. Like, the one scene where they're in bed together, and they just look at the chair, and then behind the chair is darkness. You know something's in that darkness, right? It doesn't yeah. ever doesn't ever show you what it is. You see, you see that. I, I, I thought that that was a really great uh, suspense builder. That's what this movie does so well. It just winds the tension up, and it just keeps going. And like when you think you're gonna get an intense scene, like it just kind of does the mo- the. Uh, the uh, time lapse of going to the next day and you just don't get that release. You just, it's the next day and you just keep that tension with you. And then it just keeps winding up again until you get a little bit of a jump scare. And then that's just it. You just have to hold on to the rest of that tension for the rest of it. But go ahead. You watch a film like when you guys watch a film like this to build on what Corey just said. Do you want that release? Um, do you want to see something crawling around in the dark that'll jump out at you, like like in the Conjuring movies, like Nicole mentioned earlier, right? Or do you like it more like this, where it leaves it more ambiguous? And um, I like it better like this, but I think you expect the other. Uh, it's like when they would uh, pull the covers over their head. And then, like Corey said, it, you, you, you feel like when they take the covers down, there's going to be the Babadook's going to do something. Um, but it, it, it goes to the next day. It kind of keeps you lingering to wonder when it's going to be harmful to them. But it really never did anything to them except in their minds, in their hearts. Right. Oftentimes, oftentimes these films rely on these jump scares, right? They just blow. Kirsten mentioned this earlier too, right? About sound effects, right? You'll have complete silence and boom, mm. loud noise, and that makes you go, oh, right? Yeah. I've never, I've never liked those. That's, I've always thought that those were cheap. Like, as far as my film appreciation goes, like I've always thought that's a cheap, cheap trick. That's like I, I like this kind of thing better. I guess that's where I'm going. I love the scene where she's watching TV and she looks over and she sees Samuel and Samuel's got the blood out, coming out of his mouth and he's just all bloodied up. And she yelled and she went to go and like go and hug him or whatever she was going to do going like figure out what was going on and then he screamed and it it pans back to her and she's got a knife in her hand that that freaked me out so much because i was like oh my god samuel's samuel's bloodied up and then she you're seeing her reaction and then it pans back to him and it goes back to her And she's got the knife. And it's like, oh, my God, she was about to stab him. Like, it just, it showed you the shock. And then it showed you, oh, my God, it could have been so much worse. It could have been for real, for real. Yeah, when I seen her grab that knife, I'm sorry, Corey. I seen her grab the knife, I started freaking. I already knew what she was going to do. But I apologize, buddy. Go ahead. No, you're good. I feel like I've been talking a little too much today anyways. But Um. (laughs) I just, I got scared really good, like four or five different times in this movie. And I'd only gotten scared like maybe three times out of all the horror movies we've watched. This one genuinely, like it, it scared me. I'm getting a not lot tonight. (laughs) I love the noise the creature makes that. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a. That's pretty freaky. Right? We didn't we didn't talk about that that noise it makes. It reminds me in the uh, movie Ghost, um, 
that when they would die, when when people would die, uh, and they would go down into the like the drainage system, and the demons would come and get them, they had that same type of noise, um, and it does put uh, chills up your spine when you hear that. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie, Patrick Swayze. Was that the Patrick Swayze movie? Yes, yeah. yes. And Demi Moore. Demi, yeah, that's right. Whoopi, Whoopi was in it too. Whoopi Goldberg, yes. That was a, that was, now to, see to me, now I got scared in that movie a couple of times. But I'm like uh, Corey too. I'm, you know, I got, I got a little frightened here in this one too. It was real. Just the just the like costume it has with the top hat and all that like can't really it's hard to even like place why that's creepy but it is right <laughs> like the Babadook's hat magician thing that it has going on. I'm curious. I wonder if they actually have a Babadook book you can buy like uh, like in the movie. I bet they I bet they do now. I bet they do. Yeah, don't don't give that one to a kid, right? Yes. Unless you want them to turn out like me later in life, right? <laughs> there, there is a Babadook book. I'm not sure if it's that book or if it's something else, but um, yeah, there is one because I've seen it online. I mean, I've seen where they, you know, advertised it. She says... Kirsten just said it's limited. It costs over a hundred dollars now. So, <laughs> wow. So, yeah, we got a lot. Just to sum up here, we got a lot of good deep range with horror. Right? This is the first movie we've really watched about a family, right? The parenting relationship. Well, maybe The Exorcist too. The Exorcist had that too. Um, yeah, the Exorcist, the thing we got monsters and gross horror silence of the lambs we got a very much a psychological suspense lighthouse going mad and this was very much a movie about going mad too so these two, those two movies even kind of bounce off each other pretty nicely so i'm glad that some of you who didn't like horror before now have more yeah. so i'm glad i'm glad of that I like to think that I have good taste with, with my horror films. Right? Like to think so. But there's lots of them I wish we could have done. I wish we could have done Psycho. I wish we could have done the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, those are two that I definitely, those are two that I would normally do in this type of glass too. Have you ever seen As Above, So Below? I did. I did not like that film. I had to watch it a couple times before I liked it, but I don't know. There's just something about it. Yeah, that's one of those found footage types of horror films, right? Where it's all in first person through the lens of a camera, right? There's no editing in those movies, right? That's that's one of the like a Blair Witch Project. It's like one of the it's like that type of film. Yeah, now we're moving on to comedy. Comedy is next up. Their next film up is Blazing Saddles. So Blazing Saddles, is, as you'll find out, it has the same exact plot almost as Once Upon a Time in the West. It very much riffs on Once Upon a Time in the West. But it's Mel Brooks. Um, this, this movie, if you've never seen it before, about 21st century humor standards, it's going to shock you. You know, it says, uh, it's going to say the N word a lot, just to, just, to, just to brace yourselves. But think about how it uses it. Like before you, before you want it to take a, before you want to take a pitchfork you know, flame to the movie, right? Think about how it uses it, right? That's one thing that I'll, that I'll say. That, it'll, well, we could have fit this within the Western, because this movie almost destroyed the Western, as I mentioned earlier, right? But um, this it's great, it's great comedy. I, I think you guys will once you. This is a very sophisticated group. I think you guys will 
I appreciate it. It's a very hard movie to teach, you know, though, just because it is, it, as far as like how everything's so politically correct and stuff these days, this is not a PC movie. But so uh, I will look forward to hearing your thoughts. Kirsten will be our presenter on, on this movie. So she will be presenting. Those of you who've already presented, I'm still, I still got to get your feedback. All of you have done so, so far have done great. So, I mean, I, th I don't think, I think all, pretty much everybody's presented is probably going to get an A on it, right? Because I, every one of you did well in inciting conversation and all that stuff. So I don't have any doubts that all of you will do well with that. I still need to come up, actually write it up, though. I will write it up for you, but I think everybody's done great so far, so I expect it to continue. Still, we still have Nicole left, Kirsten, Ryan, and Ryan. I think those are the three students we have left who still need to present. All right, so we've got lots of interesting range in our comedies coming up. We got Blazing Saddles, we've got Steel Magnolias, which which is a really in, still Mac. If you guys haven't thought that there's lots of, I think I've given a lots of female representation in this class. Yeah, but, you know, but this that movie is definitely one that'll check that box. It's a really good one. Um, we're doing the Breakfast Club. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, John Hughes, one of the famous John Hughes 80s films. The Big Lebowski we're doing on 420, right? Which is which is appropriate once we once you see the movie. Um, yeah, we're well, looking forward to the next few weeks. We'll talk about some great comedies. Comedy is a hard genre too, because it's so subjective. Humor is a subjective thing. What's funny to one person is not funny to another. So will be an interesting genre to discuss. I always wait till the end because I want to opt to do comedy because I want to make sure we do all this other stuff first. Comedy kind of riffs on everything, right? All right, so we'll see you guys next time. Okay, have a good day, everyone. You guys too? Hey, Dr. Yeager. I have um, a uh, suggestion on a comedy movie maybe for your next class or something like oh brother where art thou is great in um just like the history of the day um it's funny it's well written and it was actually um from dad what movie was that 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 was from the um it was from the book the odyssey it had a, the book, a, odyssey. a reflection of the odyssey yeah, I, I like Old Brother Where Art Thou. It's a Coen Brothers film. So we yeah. already we already did No Country for Old Men, but um, Big Lebowski is a Coen Brothers comedy too. Wow. And they also did another great comedy called Fargo. Uh, Fargo. It's a it, yeah, it's a dark, really dark comedy though. But I've they're... not seen it, but I've been wanting to see it. Yeah, that's that's a good. That's a really dark comedy like you have these north dakota people and he's talking these like really exaggerated north dakota accents and stuff right yeah like um, you could almost interchange a coen brothers comedy in the comedy section just because they've done so many great ones right yeah, yeah we was talking about it the other day and i i just thought that you know i'd mention it to you for your um i mean for your next class or for if we do get together and talk about something, you know, whatever. That would be a good one to do in our discussion group after this class. You know? Right. It would. Yeah, I mean, it, me and Dad quote it all the time. <laughs> but, you know, I've watched it the other day and I watched it differently. I watched everything, commercials differently than I used to. Because I'm like, well, look at that camera. <laughs> what about this sound? What about this? <laughs> yeah, this lighting right here. It's been so many years since I've seen it. Like I, when I, like last time I saw it was probably when I was a kid. So it'd be interesting to go back and rewatch it now through the lens of all these tools we have at our disposal. So. Mm -hmm. I watch uh, two movies uh, every year. Uh, one one is the Passion of the Christ, and the other one is the uh, 
Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> That's the two movies I watch every year. I watch them. <laughs> yeah, Passion of the Christ is a good film. Mel, Mel Gibson directs. So. And that's that's heavy. Yeah, that def, definitely is is that. I don't want to keep you. I just um, thought about that the other day and wanted to say something while I remembered because I'm if I don't say what I remember, I ain't gonna right. remember. <laughs> I'm out of here. Crystal, I'm going to Mama's to eat dinner tonight. What are you having? I don't know, but I'm going. I'll eat anything they serve. <laughs> Talk to you later. See you guys. All right. Bye. Bye.